uh, where the world, I think, has been very unfair with Pakistan, frankly, just because their strategic interests are aligned with, let's say, India or some other country. It is that Pakistan is offering economic basis to the entire world. Not to- there is absolutely no reason for Pakistan uh, to be seen as a client to anybody. Right. Hello, you're watching Policy Beats with me, Hamza Refer. My guest today needs no introduction. He's been at the helms of strategic policy planning and making uh, under the Pakistan Tariq e Insaf government. And we're going to be speaking to him about conflict resolution, the relationship between Pakistan and India, Pakistan's relationship with the United States, and various other aspects of strategic policy planning. I'm joined by the Special Assistant to the Prime Minister at the National Security Division, Dr. Moid Yusuf. Dr. Moid Yusuf, thank you so much for joining me on Policy Beats. Now, my first question is a very simple one. Um, What are your words of wisdom as far as strategic policy planning is concerned for the wider strategic community as well as for the Pakistani public? Where do we need to go ahead as far as policy planning is concerned? You know, I think one of the weaknesses traditionally we've had in the system is that um, we've been too consumed by firefighting. Too much of it is about dealing with one crisis and then the next and the next. And countries, for that matter, companies, corporations, no entity can think through a vision, a plan, um, an action matrix on what to do, unless you've got clarity on where you want to go in the long run, not today and not tomorrow. Essentially, strategic policy planning divorces itself from what is happening here and now, thinks through where you want to go in, let's say, three years or five years or 10 years or 50 years, and works backward to decide what policy interventions you require to get there. But if you can't think long term, if you can't do a what we call a, a sort analysis, a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and, and threats, threats analysis, right. uh, looking uh, beyond the horizon, then I think you're struggling because all you're doing is putting band-aids on problems. So that's been an area that I think traditionally we haven't been as strong as some other countries. And that's what's been entrusted to the National Security Division, among other tasks. Right, absolutely. Now, coming towards idea generation, it's extremely important that there's industrialization and crystallization of ideas out there in the domain. Do you think that the upcoming Islamabad dialogue is the adequate forum for generation of ideas that can benefit us in the future? The Islamabad um, dialogue essentially builds on the theme of comprehensive security. And, you know, I I think the preferred term would be Islamabad security dialogue, um, because what we are really trying to do here is create a parallel to the world's uh, most prominent dialogues. Um, You know, you have things like the Munich Security Conference, you have the Aspen Dialogue, um, Shangri-La, you name it. Um, These dialogues involve um, state officials and uh, independent experts. This year, we are starting with independent experts only because of the COVID situation and and Pakistani officials, no foreign officials. Uh, But the idea behind this is to have Pakistan's own platform where issues that um, are important to Pakistan, the region and the world can be discussed uh, from a Pakistani perspective. Because all we hear in the world, and you know this as well as I do, we crib a lot about the fact the world is not understanding Pakistan. Right. Pakistan's narrative in the West is very negative. The world applies a uh, lens uh, on Pakistan that is not fair, and etc. But part of the reason is, frankly, we don't author books. We don't write ourselves. We don't debate issues on our platforms from our perspective still in an objective manner. This is not about uh, pushing a party line or making Pakistan look good or propaganda. Those things don't work in today's world. Is that the reason why the world hasn't, or the international community has not taken us seriously? Well, no. I mean, I think there are genuine, uh, (laughs) deep uh, strategic uh, reasons for that, which go against us, uh, where the world, I think, has been very unfair with Pakistan, frankly, just because their strategic interests are aligned with, let's say, India or some other country, they've put Pakistan in the dock very unfairly. But how do you change that? You don't change that by only saying the world is unfair. 
you change that by putting out alternative narratives and discourses. You change that by providing platforms to Pakistani speakers, to global speakers, to objectively debate issues that are important for Pakistan. Right. This is not a forum where you will hear the Pakistani official line only. This is a forum where the Pakistani official line will be debated, discussed. We will introspect, but the world will also have to listen to what truly Pakistan stands for. And here, uh, Hamza, I'd like to tell you the reason uh, I think this is an opportune moment to start this kind of dialogue is that Pakistan under the Prime Minister has a new vision. We have talked about comprehensive security. We are talking about economic security as the core interest from which everything else flows. This wasn't always clear in the past. Right, right. Uh, we are also talking about a Pakistan that is looking for connectivity, for development partnerships, for regional peace. Why are we hiding behind anything? What, what is there that we shouldn't be telling the world? And my personal view, and I've, I've aired this again and again, is that perhaps our system has been too cautious too wary of putting out our own view, worried uh, about how the world would react. We have a story to tell. It's a positive story. We have to do this proactively. We have to do this unapologetically. And the Islamabad uh, security dialogue uh, is one forum where we will be able to project this. Absolutely. Now, one of the reasons why you mentioned how the international community has a proclivity towards New Delhi as well. I mean, this has been a trend that has been witnessed for quite some time. Does the BJP government with Narendra Modi at, you know, at the very center, does it have any appetite for a ceasefire? Or do you believe that they are trying to, if they are to negotiate with Pakistan on a ceasefire, they would do it from a position of strength by revoking Article 370 in Indian illegally occupied Germany? I think it, it's a position of weakness, not strength. Look, um, as far as the ceasefire is concerned, too much is being made uh, of it. Pakistan has talked publicly about the need for both countries to go back to a ceasefire um, for months and months. But does India have an appetite for it? Well, they've come around to it now. Right. Um, if they want to do this, we are there because we've been talking about this. There's no change in Pakistan's position. Okay. Um, we do understand that there may be an effort on the other side to project, oh, this means Kashmir is resolved. Nothing is resolved. That has to be resolved under the, under the UN framework through a plebiscite. But innocent lives were being lost. So, yes, if we can get to that ceasefire, if India is going to honor it in Latin spirit, we'll stand by it because that's, I think, what we've been talking about again and again. As far as um, Kashmir uh, and, you know, you're saying position of strength, Actually, frankly, I think um, every uh, Indian who's involved in this realizes that it's backfired. Uh, we know that India is badly stuck in uh, the illegally occupied Kashmir um, and probably will want a way out. So if anything, I think it's a position of weakness. Um, we have stood for peace and again and again. We've talked about the need for dialogue. But frankly, uh, it should be taken as weakness. What we are saying is, India has to create the enabling environment. We've already laid out what that means in Kashmir. Once that happens, absolutely. Everybody knows that the only way forward is talk and peace. But, but laying out that environment would also mean that Pakistan should, con or Islamabad should condition it with going back on the revocation of Article 3. But that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So what is an enabling environment? Political prisoners, military siege, communication block, uh, blackout. Um, there's a whole list of things. Right. And if that enabling environment is there, absolutely. I mean, the Prime Minister said it again and again. The Army Chief has, uh, has said it. We've communicated it publicly. We're ready. Right. Okay. So if you take a look at the international environment at this point in time, there is bellicose rhetoric from both Washington and Beijing. I mean, you have the U.S.-China rivalry, which after the post-Trump era has escalated to a large extent. You have theaters of conflict, for example, the South China Sea, and you also have you know, the Afghan peace process, which is taking place. How important, according to you, is for Pakistan to balance its foreign policy priorities in light of the U.S.-China, um, you know, rivalry? Because we do understand that we have an all-weather friendship with China. It's also important to balance ourselves strategically uh, within this rivalry as well. You know, um, Pakistan is not into camp politics. Um, you know, the world is talking about a return to a bipolar world. It's actually not a bipolar world. I mean, the situation is very, very fluid. The equilibrium has been disturbed. 
uh, there's a clear rise uh, of China. Uh, we can project what the future is going to look like. But at this point, uh, I think there is no sense anywhere that camp politics is going to suit the world in terms of regional or global peace. Uh, yes, our relationship with China is simply non-negotiable. It's right. going from strength to strength. Uh, CPEC is non-negotiable. We will continue improving that relationship. Does that mean that we are going to essentially shun away everybody else? No. We want a very good relationship with the US. Uh, we've said that we are the only country that can talk to all Muslim countries in a fr friendly manner. Um, so what we want, I mentioned the comprehensive security vision. What is it? It is that Pakistan is offering economic bases to the entire world, not military bases. So anybody who wants to come and invest, who wants to partner with us on development, we are ready. So the entire vision is built in our, around three pillars, connectivity, development partnerships, and regional peace. That's what we stand for. Anybody that fits that prism is welcome to be here. We want a very strong relationship with the US, uh, with the Middle East, with Russia, uh, and China, of course, as I said, is non-negotiable. Now, when you talk about ensuring that the relationship is more fluid, it's also important to, you could say, revive the relationship with the United States, because for quite some time, Pakistan has been a client state of the United States. When we talk about the amount of aid that has been poured in and the United States leveraging Pakistan for its own strategic objectives in the region as well. Do you think there's a need now for Pakistan to negotiate with the Joe Biden administration beyond this client state, you could say, paradigm? Yes, no question about it. Okay. And not only United States, if you talk of comprehensive security vision, the the uh, foundation for that in terms of your own conduct of diplomacy has to be proactive, has to be unapologetic, has to be pragmatic. What does that mean? It essentially means you have to know yourself well. You have to be confident in your own story. That's where I think we perhaps have been too shy. It's not going to happen now. There is absolutely no reason for Pakistan uh, to be seen as a client to anybody. Right. Um, you know, uh, one of the largest countries in the world, um, the, the strength of our market, we shouldn't downplay or underplay that. I think we, we, do, we are guilty of that. So yes, um, I think we're not up for any uh, client arrangement, for any military basis, for any kinetic action um, uh, on Pakistani territory. Uh, we are going to deal with other countries as uh, equals. And this message has been conveyed clearly to the new US administration. Okay, that was my next question, the, how, whether this has been conveyed Absolutely. to the Joe Biden administration. Absolutely. Dr. Moit, finally, um, when we talk about where do you think strategic policy planning previously has gone wrong? And where do you think Pakistan's redressal of that strategic policy planning that has taken place previously, um, where do you think that's actually going at this point in time? Do you, what, what about course correction? If you can give out a message regarding course correction. Uh, Amza, look, all uh, governments come in peculiar situations um, and have to make decisions based on what they, uh, the, the plate that's in, uh, in front of them, however full or empty it is. What we've lacked is a dedicated office, people, capacity, resources, tasked to think beyond tomorrow, tasked to think strategically, and then to plug in that strate strategic analysis and conversation in day-to-day -day decisions. Okay. You know, Pakistan is a country that hasn't had the luxury and we're not going to have the luxury to get out of our day-to-day -day firefighting for some time to come. Look at our region, look at the neighborhood, look at the environment. Uh, look at the global uh, challenges and, frankly, the domestic uh, political and, and security and economic challenges. So it's only natural that leadership gets caught up in the day-to-day. -day. Where is that place which is still able to divorce itself, think about future perspectives and inform the system on how even today's decisions would be better if they were to internalize this strategic thinking? That's now... Uh, partly being done uh, in the National Security Division. But there's also a culture and that has to be built and we're pushing hard where every ministry, every department, every stakeholder should have their own think tank. Think tank doesn't mean a big establishment, really means minds who can think through this strategic perspective and then incorporate that into that institution's thinking. That's the next step. And then the third part of this is that, frankly, as a public sector, Pakistan has not always valued academia and think tank research and analysis. All successful models in the world 
have the used, United States is a very good example. Great example. example. Have used think tanks and uh, relevant university departments in national security advice and policy input. And generation of ideas. Correct. Right. right? That's where the Istanbul dialogue comes in. But also, frankly, at the dialogue, I'm happy to inform you that we are launching something called the NSD advisory portal, where all registered think tanks who work in the national security space, broadly defined, and relevant university departments uh, are going to be part of a dedicated uh, effort. Uh, they will have password protected accounts where they would be able to directly provide policy input to the national security division on any issue they're working on. And then it, it is upon us to take that internalize it yeah. and then send it to whoever the relevant ministries are or implement it that connection has been missing and this is the start of that where we'll they'll have direct access to us we will work with them directly and actually the best ideas sometimes come from outside the public sector so we're going to start benefiting from that dr moed yusuf thank you so much for joining me on policy it's a pleasure. All right. thank you. So that's all that we have for this edition of Policy Beats. You've heard it from the Special Assistant to the Prime Minister on the National Security Division with regard to his views on Pakistan's long-term strategic policy planning, as well as Pakistan's relationship with the United States and how to deal with a rather belligerent India right next door. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, as well as on other social media platforms. From Hamza Rifat, take care and stay safe.